There's a verse in the, in the Bible that um, I read, and I think, oh man, that, that kind of makes me nervous. The book of John, chapter 5, Jesus is talking to a group of people, a group of men who knew their Bible inside and out. Like they had their, our Old Testament, that's their Bible, they had the entire thing memorized. I mean, they, these people knew Scripture. And Jesus looked at them, and here's what he says in John 5. He says, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. And I think sometimes we come to texts and we come to stories in the Bible that many of us have heard over and over. And we sometimes don't stop long enough to actually get there in the story. And I I think as we talk about Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, it's one of those stories that, again, most of us probably grew up hearing. But this morning, My prayer has been that we would absolutely experience the story, that it would reach our hearts, not just our heads. Today is a lot of say Easter Sunday in the the church. Sometimes we call this Resurrection Sunday because that's what it is. Um, Go back in your mind with me a couple days to Friday, what we call Good Friday. See, we get to the text in the Bible in Luke Luke 23, 44, and we read this about Good Friday. Listen to this. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. And it takes about, this was taught to me several years ago, and I have never forgotten it. It's changed the way I've studied the Bible. Because it was said to me, yeah, how long does it take to read that verse? Well, I timed it. It took me about 5.3 seconds, okay? So it doesn't take long to read that verse. That's how long it takes to get to your head, The problem is, this needs to reach our hearts. The Bible is something not just to get to our heads, it's to reach our hearts for us to experience. And I started thinking, what does it take for me to experience that text? I don't know how many of you have been to, uh, like, on a cave tour, probably a lot of you. I I know when I was a kid, my dad took my brother and I to uh, Mammoth Cave. I don't know if you've been to Mammoth Cave. But like every cave tour is the same. At some point, the guide or the ranger at Mammoth Cave stops. He gets you together and he says, here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to turn off all the lights. You ever been there in a cave and you turn off all the lights? You've probably been there. You know, when it goes off, like it is absolute darkness. Like you can't see your hand in front of your face. It is absolute darkness. Let me tell you, that is what's going on as Jesus is on the cross. All of a sudden, there is absolute darkness. A week from tomorrow, there's something going on. If you didn't know, you know what's going on a week from tomorrow? There's an eclipse. Okay, how long will that eclipse last here in Hohenwald? In Hohenwald, it's projected to last exactly three minutes. Do you know what the longest eclipse is in history? I'm sure you do, because I'm sure you studied that this week. It's seven minutes and 27 seconds, okay? I tell you that to tell you what's going on is not an eclipse. How else do we know that? Well, Passover always happens. They have a lunar calendar. Passover always happens on a full moon. What's a full moon? You have the earth here, the sun here, and the moon here. That's why it's full. What happens on eclipse? New moon, okay? So we know for sure here at Passover, when there's this three hours of darkness, this is a supernatural thing that God does just turning off the lights, right? Now imagine, we know there's soldiers there at the cross, right? Imagine the soldiers. What do you th- Why are there soldiers there, by the way? Why would you need soldiers? Well, if you have a family member that's up on the cross, do you think you want to get him down? So you better have people protecting those people on the cross. So you have soldiers, and probably a lot of them, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then all of a sudden, think about it, at 12 o'clock, when it's the sun is brightest in all of the day, everything goes black for three hours. If you're one of those soldiers, what do you do? I bet they're nervous as they can be. 
Like, my job is to protect these people. I bet they turned around, got shoulder to shoulder, drew their swords. They don't know what's going to happen next. Like, what's going on here, right? Now, I want, you to, I want you to get there because that's what it looks like for Scripture to reach your heart, not just your head. Is you stop long enough to say, God, what is going on here? And this is what I see happening. Now, I don't know. Someday we'll find out exactly what happened. Or, you know, we can watch The Chosen and find out either one. But that's what it means to experience the Bible. And, and, I, and I tell you that just on this Easter Sunday, that this book is not something to just gain head knowledge from. It's something that God says, I want to invite you in to my story. And I want you to experience it, and I want it to change your life. Three days later, we get to Easter Resurrection Sunday. Now, I want to do something this morning that you're going to feel like you're back in kindergarten again. I want you to close your eyes. Don't be too macho that you can't do this. Close your eyes and listen to Luke 24 on what happened at sunrise on today. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, the women came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. You see them? They couldn't prepare the body because it was sundown when Jesus died. So here they are. They prepared it. They're ready to come, and they're, they're at the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. You see the tomb? And the, sto the stone rolled away. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. I bet they were just scared to death. Here are these two men. We came to see Jesus, and there's these two men. What's going on? And as the women were terrified, they bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. And you can open your eyes. In that moment, guys, everything changed. In that moment, that all of a sudden it became clear that Jesus was who he said he was. He is raised from the dead. In that moment, everything changed. This morning, we're going to talk about the importance of the resurrection. This is a huge event. It, you cannot overstate the importance our text today, that we're going to look at how, we, how do we see the importance of the rest. We could spend three weeks, a month, two years, our lifetime talking about the importance. But this is the message God gave to me for today. First Peter chapter 1. Let me, let me read our text, and then we're going to spend the next few minutes unpacking it. And here's what it says, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Pray with me. God, I thank you for this Resurrection Sunday, for what you've done. God, I pray for our hearts in these moments as we unpack your word. You're the one that has to speak into our hearts. Your spirit has to do his work that I can't or no one here can do. Only you can. But God, you can do it because you're alive. And that's why we're celebrating today. Teach us about what it looks like to live resurrected lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a handout today, actually it's in your, your chair there, um, I have a several points that I want to kind of talk about in relation to this text. The first one is this, the resurrection is evidence of God's great 
mercy. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Now, what is mercy? Sunday school, you kind of talk about the difference between grace and mercy. What's mercy? Mercy is when God does not punish us even though we deserve it. It's him withholding the punishment we deserve. Romans 4.25 says that Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. The resurrection of Jesus is why we can be justified. Make no mistake, without the resurrection, the cross doesn't mean anything. That's not me saying that. That's 1 Corinthians 15. If there was no resurrection, our faith is futile. If there was no resurrection, you are still in your sins. You understand the resurrection is why we are free. It is what justified us. It is what paid for our sins. That's why we should be excited today as we come to worship. Because it's not about, Easter is not about some bunny rabbit. It's not about some political agenda either. It is not about, this is the day, I proclaim this day, this is what we celebrate. No, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is about Jesus. And it's what pays for us being able to be with God for all eternity. This is a big day. So today we come and we celebrate this great mercy of God that that He paid the price for our sins. Did you deserve your sins to be paid for? I know I didn't. Can we be good enough to pay for our sins? No. Romans 3.23, familiar verse. For all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. That's all of us, right? That's where we are. We are born because of the curse, because of the the sin nature in us. We are sinners. But Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I say this a lot. The wages of sin, what I deserve, the wage is death. Like when we work, we get a wage. That's what you deserve for working. What I deserve for my sin and what you deserve for your sin is death. But God, he gave us the free gift. A gift is something you don't deserve, I don't deserve. And it's eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Understand God is a merciful God. We don't deserve that. You know, there are many people, I've talked to people who have this view of God, that God is always out to get them. Like, oh, he messed up again. All right, I get to get onto him again. Listen, that is not God. Ephesians 4, 2 says that God is rich in mercy. That's who God is. That's why he sent Jesus. He is rich in mercy. It's because he loves us. I I was thinking this week, I think God gives us kids so that we can just have a small taste of what it looks like to love like God loves us. Like God created us, and I can't imagine how much he loves me that he would send his only son to die for me. But that is his mercy. And what I want you to see is when those women got to that tomb that morning, and Jesus wasn't there, and it was resurrected, that is the moment where God's great mercy began to be put on display. He is rich in mercy. So this morning, that's what we celebrate. And by the way, he doesn't give us mercy because we have anything to bring to the table. It's because of who he is. Man, he's good. Two, the resurrection gives us a living hope. Let's keep going. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let me ask you a question. What did you hope for when you were growing up? Like, what did you dream about? I bet nobody else dreamed my dream. I dreamed I would be a professional tennis player. Anybody else? Didn't figure so. Um, So growing up, I played a lot of, of tennis. Started playing at the age of four and played in tournaments a lot in the summer. I started playing on the high school team in sixth, in seventh grade. So I had six years of high school tennis. But I dreamed about playing in Wimbledon. That's what I always, I would watch Wimbledon. I thought, man, I want to be there. You know, when we grow up, you have these hopes. And then you get older, and it's like, wow, that didn't turn out. But here's what happens. We start putting our hope 
in other things. For instance, sometimes we can place our hope in money and our finances. And so all of a sudden, we start working and working and working, and the purpose of it is to build up money. And then we figure out how can we invest. And because if we have enough, we're set. We are set. No matter what comes our way, we are set. Or we can start putting all our hope in our education. So listen, you need to go to school. You need to get a degree. You need to do this, and because if you have that, nobody can ever take it away from you. Like, you will be good. Nothing bad can happen to you because you are set for life. Or we can say, you know what? We live in the greatest nation in the world, and we have the best military in the world. And so I put my trust that, you know what? We're good here. Nobody can ever do anything to us. Or we can say, you know what? I want to make my body as good as it can be. So I'm going to only eat kale and tomatoes. And and I'm going to work out 17 times a day. And I'm going to be the fittest I can be. I'm going to run three marathons every month. And we can put our hope in that because we want to live as long as we can. Now, let me say this. I'm not saying any of those are bad. Listen, listen to me carefully. Is it wise for us to invest well? Is it wise for us to have money for a rainy? You know what? The Bible teaches that. I think we should do a better job as the church teaching that. Is it wise for us to to, to encourage people to get an education? Listen, I couldn't do what I do every day without an education. I think sometimes God does that so that he can put us in the position where he wants us to succeed for his glory, right? Is it bad that we live in America? No, I love America. I love living here. You go overseas and you say, wow, I I love where God has placed me. That's great. Or or even, is it wrong to to work out and to eat healthy? No. I mean, God says, take care of yourself, right? I want to be used as long as possible. But here's when it's wrong, is when we put all of our hope in those things. And all of our hope goes into, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. Let me tell you why. They are all hopes that die. They're not eternal. There is one living hope, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the living hope that we are to put our entire being in. He is our living hope. You know, earlier I asked you to close your eyes. You don't have to again, unless you want to. Some of you know. But if I asked you Picture Jesus. Just what do you see? Most of the time, the answer is, I see Jesus on the cross. He's paying for my sins. And that's not bad. Sometimes people say, well, I see him teaching the disciples. Okay, it's great. Okay. Do you know the Bible says that right now, Jesus is alive and he's someplace. Where is he? He's at the right hand of the Father. And so when you picture Jesus, you should picture him on his throne at the right hand of the Father because we serve a living God. And sometimes we make fun of, say, sometimes Catholics have these crucifixes, right, that has Jesus still on the cross. Well, why don't you get Jesus off that cross? But we do the same thing. When we think about Jesus, we think about him on the cross. And yes, I am thankful that he paid for my sins, but he is alive. That's why we worship today. That's why we worship today. Because he lives, listen, so will we. Romans 6, 5 says that we will be united with Jesus in his resurrection. Our hope is living. Our hope is living. Now, for you parents in here, I ask you a question here. This is what I wrestled with this week. What are you teaching your kids to put their hope in? What are you teaching your kids to to put their hope in? Because if it's anything other than the living Jesus Christ, we're missing it. We're missing it. Now I ask you, every one of you, is your hope fully in Jesus? Or is there something else that you're putting your hope in? Third, 
The resurrection allows us to have an incredible inheritance. Verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. An inheritance, for those of you, maybe kids that don't know what that word means, it's property or possessions passing from an owner at the time of the owner's death to an heir that is entitled to succeed. It's someone, a parent, giving their possessions, their money to their kids. Samuel Moore Walton. Know who he is? We have a store here called Walmart. Heard of Sam's Club? Sam Walton, okay? Now, he started the first Walmart in 1962 in Arkansas. He passed away 30 years later, 1992, okay? He has several children. Today, get this, his children are worth $224 billion. Billion. And and you may think, Man, I I can't imagine somebody needing that much money. Like, how could you possibly, like, you could have 100 lifetimes and not go through $224 billion. Did you know, since November of uh, 2021, since November, Elon Musk has lost $200 billion. Now, he's doing fine. Don't have to worry or cry. He's got $147 billion left, okay? And I think he's going the right direction now, maybe. I don't know. But I say that to say, no matter what we have in this life, is temporary. No matter what we have in this life, it is. Now, I imagine that Sam Walton's kids were pretty sad the day he died, I'm sure. But I'm pretty sure whenever the lawyers came to them and said, you know what, your dad's left you something, they probably were pretty excited about what he left them. They probably didn't say, no, I'm not interested in that. Give that to dad's favorite charity, right? No, it's like, okay. And they I'm sure they rejoiced over the inheritance they received. Now, I'm sure they missed their dad. Don't get me wrong that that inheritance is temporary. It is temporary. And what Peter says is, know this, because of the resurrection, you Christians have have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away. What inheritance is he talking about? What inheritance do we have? We have heaven, eternal life, right? Right? And what he's saying is this, it is imperishable. And what that means is it's not going to decay with time. Things here decay. Like if you have a house and you don't live in it for several years, what's it going to look like when you come back several years later? It's going to have problems, right? Or let's say your car's messing up and you say, you know what, I'm just going to buy a new one and you park the other one out back of your house and you don't drive it for several years. What's it going to look like? probably going to be rusted and have all kinds of issues. Even our bodies, right? They decay. Like right after I turned 40, like I was playing basketball with uh, no one's middle school basketball team. And it was really an embarrassing situation because we weren't playing against them. It was just kind of shooting threes and you're going to get your rebound. And I went to get my rebound on my very first shot and I tripped over my new shoes and I fell and I broke my wrist. And I thought, wow, the body really does go downhill at 40. They're, They're telling the truth. And I say that because we have perishable things here. Here's the thing. Our eternal life, heaven, is absolutely imperishable. It will never decay. It will never lose its luster. It will be amazing. And then it says it will be undefiled, meaning it won't have any stains. It won't be tainted. Like Julie makes fun of me because like every time I do anything, I get a stain on me. Like where did you do this time? And she has to figure out a way to get it out. Sin stains us. We can live in this world, y'all know this, and we're around sin, and guess what happens? It can stain us. One day, listen, we are in heaven with a perfect God in a holy place, and guess what? There is nothing to stain us. It is undefiled, and then it says, will not fade away. Think about how things fade here. I was looking at, we have a little garden flag right out in front of our house, a little, little small thing. And I was looking at it the other day and I noticed one side is really faded. That's what things do here. Colors fade. I would say also excitement fades. Like you can be really excited about something one day and the next day it, it loses its luster. That's what things do here. Things 
fade. But that's not true with our internal inheritance. There will be no fading. There will be no lost excitement. Man, we are going to have fun in heaven. But here's the thing you need to hear. Nothing on earth can change that. Not a war, not a famine, not something from our political system. There's nothing, no stock market issue. Nothing can affect our inheritance because of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, now what do you have to do to get that inheritance? Like, what did, what did the Walton kids have to do to receive their inheritance? Well, they probably had to sign their name, I'm imagining. But they didn't have to do a lot. They didn't have to work to get that inheritance. Like they didn't say, well, you know, he's going to give you $70 billion, so you've got to work that off, and you can get it. No, it's, this is yours. Do you want it or not? It has your name on it. That is exactly what Jesus is offering us. An eternal inheritance. He's given us a free gift of an inheritance that's way better than the Walton kids. You may not realize that. We are so temporal. We are. We are so focused on today and this life. Guys, there is a much greater, better life awaiting us in heaven. There is. And it is going to be awesome. My question to you this morning, have you accepted that inheritance? Have you accepted it? Last point. The resurrection gives us reason to rejoice even though we go through trials. Verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice, you greatly rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We've been talking in here over the last several weeks about the book of James and about trials. I think that's why God brought me to this text for today, is we're talking about all these trials. Now listen, were Peter's audience, in a, they're in Asia Minor, are they going through trials? Do you think it's hard to be in Asia Minor in their day and be a believer in Jesus? The answer is yes. Because there's a lot of pressure to serve all the Gentile gods. And so here's what Peter is trying to tell them. Is you have, yes you have trials, but you can rejoice in those trials. Why? Because God's rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. Not only that, you have a living hope. God is alive and last. You have an an amazing inheritance one day. But here's the other thing I was thinking. Verse 6, listen to what it says. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Guys, I know some of you, I know some of your story, and I know right now you're going through a trial. I do. I want you to hear this. Our trials here are temporary. They are temporary. And I was thinking about Jesus Did Jesus go through trials? The answer is absolutely yes. Did Jesus suffer? Yes. And he showed us what it looks like to suffer well. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he suffered well. He suffered well. But do you know what? His suffering was temporary. He is alive today in heaven. He's not on the cross anymore. And whatever you're going through today, whatever trial you're going through, and you're thinking, I just don't know how I can get through this, know that it is temporary. There is a day coming where we will be with Jesus. There will be no more trials. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more suffering. And that is why we rejoice today in our living hope. We serve a resurrected Jesus. And that's why, even though we can't see him, we can love him. We can believe in him, knowing one day we'll be with him. So when I say he is risen, you say he is risen indeed. That is why we're here. Now, as we, as we finish, I cannot share an Easter service without clearly, clearly going through the gospel. 
Some of you here may have never accepted that inheritance. But I'll say this too. There are some of you here that are believers and you've lost the luster of the resurrection. Listen to what Jesus did. See, I know me and my heart. I am a sinner to the core. And God looked at my sin and he looked at your sin. And he said, I love him. I love her. I created him. I created her. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to send Jesus to come down from heaven and pay for their sins. Can you imagine Jesus? He's in heaven. He's communing with the Father. Like everything's good. And all of a sudden he has to come down here. And he's born in a nasty, smelly, gross cave in Israel. And he spends his life living according to his Father's will, living God's word out, showing us what it looks like to live by the Spirit, to reject our flesh. And there are people that didn't want anything to do with him. The ones that didn't want anything to do with him are the religious. They're the ones that say, I know God, I love God, I know his word. And so the last week of his life, he's mocked. He's beaten. They spit on him. He's he's treated worse than any human can possibly be treated. And they put him on the cross, sentence him to death. The most painful death you can imagine on that cross where you can't even get the next breath. And it goes black. Three hours. All of a sudden you hear this voice, I'm thirsty. And and they get a sponge and they dip it in the sour wine and they put it to his lips and he drinks. And at that moment, you understand, he drank the cup of God's wrath. That's Jeremiah 25. That's Isaiah 51. At that moment, he drank the cup of God's wrath that covers our sins. And then the Bible says, he said, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit. There's this earthquake. And the veil is torn. And all of a sudden, that centurion that had all those soldiers at the foot of the cross looks up at this man and he says, surely this man is the son of God. And he begins to praise him. They bury him, put him in a tomb. Three days later, We get the story of the women coming to the tomb. And no, he's not dead. He is alive. Jesus came to pay the price of your sin and my sin. And he lived a perfect, sinless life. Because you can't be in heaven if you have sin. You can't. He's perfect. He is pure. He is blameless. And if you go there and you have sin, you taint it. The only way we get there is for us to accept who Jesus is. Because in God's great mercy, he says, I'm sending Jesus to die. And now, if you just accept it, you have eternal life. An incredible inheritance. He is, guys, your living hope. Don't put your hope in anything else. Bow your heads with me. First off, if you're a believer and you've accepted that inheritance, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to ask you, is your hope really in Him? Like, is there anything right now in your heart you're putting your hope in that is dead? Maybe this morning where you are is you need to surrender to your living God. And here in a few minutes as we sing, I'm going to invite you to come and to just lay whatever it is at the altar and surrender to him. There's nothing you could do better on this Easter Sunday than to surrender to Jesus yet again and say, God, I want to glorify you. But some of you here may have never accepted Jesus. And in this resurrection day, listen, there is no better day in the calendar for you to accept what Jesus has done for you. He longs to give you an inheritance. 
His mercy is great. His hope is living. His inheritance is incredible. And I'm just inviting you here. If you need to accept Jesus, guys, this is the day of salvation. And I'm going to invite you as we sing in just a moment to come up to the front and we can walk through Scripture together and you can have a living hope and accept the mercy that Jesus offers you. That's why we're here. We have reason to celebrate. Father, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for sending Jesus to come and pay the price for my sins. I did not deserve it. But God, you did it anyway because you love me and you have so much mercy. That's who you are. God, protect me from putting my hope in anything besides you. God, whatever you need to do in our hearts right now, God, I pray that you would do it. We invite your spirit to have his work amongst us. It's in Jesus' name. I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died.